And so finally, voila, here we are, everybody, at the International Women's Action Camp. And I am so glad to see you all here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we started and everything. And as Gunnar was at the report, it was her and Agneta and Ella that told us, you know, talk about what was happening up here north and that there was war practices. And we had no idea at all. And that goes for the most of the population in Sweden. There is an area the size of Belgium in our country that is designated for war practice and most people have no idea. So earlier this year with Bufu we went on a tour throughout Sweden and we talked about the militarization of Sweden and about this neat area and uh, most of the people we talked to this was the first time they ever heard about this. So it is like this that most Sweden people here in Sweden and abroad, they still have this picture in their head of Sweden as a neutral country, as a peaceful country, alliance free and as an independent voice in world politics. And I'm sorry to say that's very far from true. And I thought of great resolutions, but maybe after the town square meeting we had you have none left. <laughs> But I have to tell you that Sweden is in an ongoing war in Afghanistan with over 550 soldiers under NATO command. We recently sent uh, Jaws Vietnam war planes to Libya. We professionalized the army, so there's no conscription anymore, but huge PR campaigns to convince people to join the army or to militarize the minds of the rest of the population. And on top of that, we are one of the world's biggest uh, weapon exporters, as we've heard of. And after the start of the Iraqi war, the sales went up 400% for the export went up. And also, we are very, very active in NATO. It is not formalized, so to avoid public debate, but we are fully integrated. So basically, what we need to be is to be a wake-up call for Sweden. People need to know what Sweden is actually a part of. And we need to tell another story, as Candice said. Another story than the one of the government and the mainstream media. We need to tell all your stories. You need to tell all your stories. So, that is what we're here for. And the way the official story goes, is that war inevitably has to happen. That war is for good and just reasons, and that war works to obtain those goals, and that if you don't believe in this, there is anyway nothing you can do about it. And those reasons for claim to wage war, uh, to liberate women, to catch a famous criminal, to build schools, to rescue civilians, uh, not only really do they sound like colonialism with a 21st century touch, they are also a good twist, but they are also complete lies. We in here know that nor are the aims true, and neither if they were, would work we the way to achieve them. The story of the just war, of why nations go to war, of how war suddenly starts, has to be broken and leaked and updated. So that was for war starts here. So let's get to the let's stop it part of it. Uh, I, I'm sure you all remember those huge demonstrations at the, the 15th of February 2003 against the Iraqi war. We all went to the street and that was great and encouraging. And a lot of people, so people went to the streets and then they went home. And that's one of the points that this campaign of war starts here. That war is easily perceived as something abstract, but the impacts, impacts on, on people's lives where the bombs fall is not at all abstract. So as I said before, war does not just happen. War is prepared for, war is planned for, war is trained for, War is paid for, war needs material, workers, science, and war needs a lot of PR. And all this is done in many places. And in all those places, war starts. And that's not abstract. 
and it's not unstoppable. So we want to make that link very, very clear. So that the next time, when demonstrations are not enough, everybody knows where to go, where we want to stop the war. So, for this last part of the official story, that there's nothing we can do about it, and this point is really dear and important to me. Yes, we can do something about it. We can do like the Tahrir Square in Egypt, like the Greenham Common Women in Great Britain, like the La Sac in France, like the people of Southern Africa in Sephardi, like the Pirate community also in South Africa, like the gays and lesbians of Zimbabwe at the Zimbabwe Book Fair, like Vieques uh, in Puerto Rico, like so many other examples that you out there are full of because I got this small sample from you. And there are so many people that have knowledge and experience in this room. And it reminds me of when I was at this uh, COP15 COP meeting in Copenhagen one and a half years ago, this uh, huge alternative climate meeting. And uh, the, the official meeting was a complete and total disaster. And I was among all those seminars and workshops at the charity one, and it struck me that it's not really about that the world is lacking alternatives. We, there are ways to organize uh, your life, to organize society, to do work, to share resources, to solve conflict. And that place where I was was just crammed with solutions. So it's not that they don't exist, they do, but they are hushed and crushed and invisibilized and made suspect and silenced to the point that people, and including myself sometimes, we sometimes tend to disbelieve in them or sometimes forget or not know as a hard fact that they exist. So I want to remind you now in the start of this and I want you to look around in the room and those that you sit next to are holders of possible futures built on solid facts. And there are so many real and wise people full of knowledge, old knowledge and new inventions in here. And whenever you are told that you are naive or unrealistic, I want you to think about this room. I want you to remember it because I think it would outperform any government that I can 